You are listening to Demystifying Organizations. In partnership with McGraw-Hill Education, I'm your host, Jeff Shatton. My guest today is Jason Freed. He's the co-founder and CEO of Basecamp, a software development company. Jason is the author of many books, including his most recent, It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work. The Economist wrote about his most recent book. Their book is funny, well-written, and iconoclastic, and by far the best thing on management published this year. I second that opinion. I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Jason Freed. Jason, thanks for joining me on. Glad to be here. So uh, you know, you, you've know, you written this uh, really brilliant book. It doesn't have to be crazy at work. Um, you've uh, created a company around a lot, of, a lot of those themes. So if we can just start with kind of high level, um, wh- why is the modern workplace sick? Oh, there's so many reasons. <laughs> Primarily... Um, disruption in, in I, I don't mean disruption by the way in like a in the silicon valley disruption thing i mean like sure. people are being interrupted uh, all day long um technology is kind of getting in people's way and our our days are being cut down into smaller moments so instead of having a an eight hour work day we have maybe a 20 minute work moment and then a 30 minute work moment and then a five minute work moment and you know we're being pulled away constantly to do other things and that's one of the primary problems with it the other is um the expectation of eternal growth Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of growth chasing going on and i'm not against growth um, but i think that there are are often unreasonable expectations around growth that force people to work longer hours um, to sacrifice a whole bunch of things for a company and uh and then kind of when you're in this mode of chasing growth uh, it's kind of like anything goes. And when anything goes, uh, a lot of good things go by the wayside, and a lot of bad things sneak into work. So, right. So, so we have the, we have this obsession with growth, and it, it certainly you see it in any business school, and really any any leader that gets touted as a great leader, um, they are growth oriented. Whether that's Steve Jobs or Jack Welch, um, or Mark Zuckerberg or anyone. Um, so, in, in your mind, what what is the downside of the growth mentality? Well, I mean, if we're going to take Zuckerberg as an example, since you brought it up, like, great example. Uh, that company is willing to do anything it takes to grow. Uh, put ethics aside. Um, put privacy invasion aside. Put data selling aside. Like, they don't care. It's just growth is, is the goal for them. And companies end up being unethical when it comes to, well, we just got to hit the numbers, got to hit the numbers, got to hit the numbers. So I think that's one of the big problems. The other thing is, frankly, like, we can always call out a few examples like that. But those are extreme outliers. Very, and extreme very, growth. Yeah. Yeah. Extreme growth, extreme outliers. Like Steve Jobs, like Steve Jobs, Zuckerberg, you know, whatever, like whatever. Like throw them away. Bezos, okay. throw them away for a moment because that's five people. You know, like what about all the other businesses, the five million businesses started every year in the United States? Like they're not all going to be that. So if we're all trying to be that, pretty much everyone is going to fail. Completely not going to make that. So what I'm interested in is building sustainable businesses that are achi- achievable and attainable by most people. And I think that looking at Apple as an example or Facebook as an example or Amazon as, as an example are actually unreasonable examples. They, they don't exist in nature. They are extreme uh, mutations. And so, right. you know, that's the problem, I think, is that when, when people hold them up as like, well, let's be like Apple. Well, you're not going to be like Apple. So what can you be like? I think that's the more interesting thing to do. But, but let's, let's, dig, let's dig deeper into this. Sure. So, of course, for the average company, they're never going to be like Apple. But what about Apple itself? And we could throw in any growth oriented company. Um, so people are working 80 hours, 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week. Yep. Um, it's even even on vacation. Right. There's really no such thing as vacation. And if I were just to put on their hat, um, the defenders of it would say, well, that's the only way that we can be Apple or Facebook. And that if, if we don't have a growth mindset and if we don't um, destroy our employees and take away any amount of their personal life, 
um, then we will never achieve the goals that we are striving for. Sure. I, I, it's not that I agree with it. I'm, I'm just, I think that's, that would be their response. How, so yeah. take, taking them as an example, what, what would you think? Well, I think it's up to each individual employee to decide if that's the kind of life they want to lead. Um, and uh, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't comment on whether or not someone else thinks that's worth it. Mm -hmm. um, all I can say is I've met many people who've worked that way for a long time earlier in their careers and spent their 20s and 30s, like their prime, doing that and not having a life outside of that. And they actually regret that. But that's, again, for them to decide, not for me. I would never mm -hmm. want to drive my employees that hard. I don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's necessary. Um, yeah, are we going to be Apple? No, but we don't need to be. Um, we don't need to be Apple. We can be a very, very successful company as we have been. We've been in business for 20 years. We've been profitable every year for those 20 years. Um, and we've done wonderful things. We've had a big influence on the industry and we work 40 hours a week. So it's absolutely possible to do it that way as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's amazing. I mean, to me, um, my, my students all place in these 80 hour week, uh, firms, mostly high consulting or investment banking. And it is, I mean, to me, it's a cancer. Yeah. Um, this, yeah. this idea that you're going to go sacrifice 10 years of your life. Um, in, Especially look, in your it, 20s. Or your in 30s, your 20s, like, at, at, at any point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, of course. It, it, and it would be one thing if, if that um, activity that they were doing was going to cure malaria or cancer. And you could say, look, I'm going to sacrifice 10 years because I'm going to cure malaria. Then totally worth it, right? 80 hours a week, like if you can have that kind of an impact, but it's not. Right, it's going to be you know point oh oh one percent addition to the bottom line at Goldman. Right. Yeah, and look again, and I want to be clear to to your listeners that I am not advocating for anything other than like what I've done and what I believe to be good, and and other people yeah. may have of course totally different opinions about that. Um, but yeah, I think that um, it's unfortunate that you know here, here's here's the here's the thing. There's so much time wasted during the day at work that it's not that these problems require 80 hours a week to solve. A lot of them require 80 hours a week because the work day is so inefficient and there's no time to actually get work done at work because people are stuck in meetings all day and on conference calls all day and more meetings. That That's why you're working 80 hours. It's not that this problem is so hard to solve that it requires twice the amount of work everyone else puts in. Plenty of people work 80 hour weeks and get nothing like and get nowhere. So it's not just like sheer hours that solve problems. It's, 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 you know, being efficient, being thoughtful and actually having a problem to solve that's worth, pro worth solving and also not doing a lot of things that normally would get in your way. So, so, I just, so can like, you walk me through, don't do it for me. Can you walk me through some of the things that you've implemented to make the workday more, more efficient? Yeah. So at Basecamp, for example, we don't have meetings. We don't have any, any, there's no moments when four or five or six people are sitting around a table for an hour talking just doesn't happen. What we do instead is we write things up. So if I want to share an idea with the company or five people or 10 people, um, I write it up in long form. I post a message in Basecamp and people get to it when they have a chance. And this means, and this is a simple thing, but it means that they're on their schedule and I'm on my schedule versus when you pull people into a room everyone has to be on the same schedule, which means everyone has to step away from work at the same time, which means that a one hour meeting with 10 people is not a one hour meeting, it's a 10 hour meeting. And that's really inefficient, right. especially when the information is not about like right now. If there's a crisis and you need to get together in a room, okay. But most things are not that and they don't have, they have nothing to do with right now. They just happen to be like when you share the information. So by, by distributing information in the written form versus in the verbal form, you can actually give people their days back. And people can claim their time back and they get more stretches of long and uninterrupted time to actually do work, which is where I think great work actually ends up happening. So that's one example. Another example is simply saying we only have uh, eight hours to work. That's it. Um, and we have deadlines to meet. And therefore, um, we are limited on time. We can't just keep adding more time to the problem. And also, that also means we're not going to keep adding more work to the problem either. We're actually going to take work away to make sure that we can get the things we need to get done uh, in in these. What, what, what do you mean by what do you mean by take work away? Yeah. So, um, for example, let's say we're working on a project, and and we give the project, let's say, six weeks to complete. Okay. Um, what we can't do is keep adding more work to those six weeks. That's unfair. It's not possible. You can't keep adding more stuff to to a fixed time frame. So, what we do instead is we give teams all the autonomy in the world to decide to cut back on the amount of work that they're supposed to do. So for example, let's say they're building a calendar 
and they have six weeks to build a calendar in Basecamp or something like that. They could come back to, to me and say, hey, um, look, uh, this is actually probably going to take nine weeks the way it's been sort of described. But how about this? What if we did it this way? Or what if we cut this feature out? Or what if we did this feature this other way, which might be 80% as good, but we could get it done in one week versus four. And there's a negotiation. And then we discuss cutting back the scope of the project to meet the time frame. So what we don't do is move the time frame. What we don't do is add more mm. work. We actually cut scope back to meet time frames. And there's a negotiation and discussion. So it, it, it's a really works. it's a really interesting approach. Um, I think it stands in pretty stark contrast with with Steve Jobs' mentality, which was to push deadlines back and keep adding features and features and features and features. And then yeah. sometimes the deadlines would be one or two years. And it, it, it's kind of like the idea of satisficing, right? That for most decisions, you just want something that's good enough to move you on to the next level or on to the next area, right? When you're buying a house, um, you're not going to optimize for the house that you buy for five years. You just want to find something that's within your within, within your budget, within the you know the, the number of bedrooms you're looking for, um, some other kitchen features or whatnot. You're not going to endlessly explore. True. Now, just just to take the other side of it for a second. Yeah. Like, I think if you're making hardware, it's a bit different, right? Uh -huh. Because you got to put a piece of hardware out in the world and that like can't be changed rapidly. Software, of course, and Apple, of course, makes a lot of software too. Software, you can change frequently all the time. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, I think, a lot easier to, to ship something simpler um, in software and then update it as you go than it would be hardware. So if you're doing hardware, it might be a little bit different. But yeah, I agree. In general, like, Here's one of the big problems with pushing deadlines and deadlines and deadlines is that when people stop believing in deadlines, then, then, then things go on forever, essentially. Number two, there's very few things that are as demoralizing as working on something for a long period of time that never ships and it may never ship. It's just, it's demoralizing. Um, three, it prevents you from doing other things and other ideas that come up along the way. If you're focused on one thing for two years, there's probably other ideas that are going to come up during those two years that you simply can't do. However, if you're able to ship things every six weeks, which is what we do, um, new ideas come up all the time and we can decide to take on something new, some new opportunity that comes around, or we can continue to, to refine and improve that thing that we have. So you just have more options when you actually are shipping more frequently and you're not locked down into, into one idea. The other problem with locking down into one idea for a long period of time is that you end up having to sort of justify the time you've spent so far, which means you will never... Very rarely, I shouldn't say never, but very rarely will you kill something two years in, even if it's not going in the right direction, because you put two years into it. It's hard to yeah, it's a sunk, throwing it's that the, work away. You yeah, know? the sunk cost fallacy. Exactly. Right. Us, once, once you, if we're doing something for six weeks and it's just not quite coming together and we, we throw that out, like it's only, we only wasted six weeks. Like it's fine. We can, get, we can get over that. But to spend two years and not ship anything and then throw it away, it's really, really hard to do. And, and how, how do the customers respond to that? To the fact that you sometimes are shipping things that would be in like a beta stage or not fully fleshed out? Well, everything we ship is fully fleshed out. It's just that we ship fewer features. So every feature okay. that we do ship is solid. It's just okay. a matter of like, it may not do seven things. It might only do four things, but it's going to do those four things really, really well. So we don't yeah. ship half features. We ship full features. We just ship the ha half the number of features, let's say, uh, with each release. So, and then we iterate and iterate and improve over time. Um, I want to uh, move our attention to some of the radical things you've done in terms of um, benefits. So uh, one of the most interesting things that you do is you um, write about that you do a three-day weekend all summer long, May through September, I believe, something yes. like that. Yes. Um, and what's, what's the thinking between b behind that and you do a 30-day uh, paid sabbatical um, every few years – um, and some other some other uh, interesting perks that are really different, and I think in contrast to other tech firms. Yeah, I mean, we feel like um, you know you can invest a lot of money in a lot of things. Uh, most companies don't really invest money into people. They look at people as a place to save money. They outsource work. They 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 uh, aggressively negotiate salaries to make sure that they're they're not paying someone a dollar too much, like. I'd much rather spend money on people. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a great place to spend money. So, uh, and also it's a great, you know, I want teams to stick around for a long period of time because hiring is expensive. You hate to lose great people. Whenever someone leaves, they, they leave with institutional knowledge that would have been handy to have. They, lose, they leave with experiences that would be good to keep inside the company. Uh, I don't mean like because there's anything private. I just mean like they have experience. Right. It's hard to build up experience, right? So, um, so we invest in our people. Um, Four-day work weeks in the summer, 
Uh, we work 32 hour weeks essentially in the summer for a few months, which is just a great thing to look forward to. And it's also a great thing at the end to like say enough of that. Let's go back to normal weeks. Um, it's right. kind of sort of a seasonal thing. Like we used to, when we were growing up, we used to look forward to summer because summer breaks, school's over, and then you get back into school later in the fall. And it just felt like a good, good change. Um, sabbaticals, 30 day sabbaticals every three years just helps people give, you know, encourages people to take a real break and get some perspective and leave work aside for a while. Vacations are one thing, but sabbaticals are something else. Um, and I think it's just an important thing to, to, to give people that length of time that's paid, by the way, as well. Um, and do, do you yeah. force, uh, do you uh, shut down people's phones on vacation? Or do you have any, like, how, how do you handle people that want to work on vacation? Uh, I mean, we don't, we don't like actively police that in, in like a, yeah. in a, in a way where we would force anyone to do anything. But um, the expectations are absolutely zero in terms of you should not be working. There okay. should be zero work. Please, we, we often remind people, please uninstall Basecamp from your phone. You know, like, it, you know, you're not, you're not working. And we just kind of remind people, and if we ever were, were to see someone chime in, like on, the, on vacation, we would just say, hey, you know, you don't need to do that. And we'd prefer if you didn't. But we're That's not going to like, you know, force things on people. But you set the expectations and you reinforce them when you, when you see someone behaving in a way that you feel like, hey, you don't have to do that. So, so I, think, I think of you as running like the humane organization right? Where fundamentally there's, you know, you have enough, you have enough margins where you can act humanely and still have, you know, high expectations for, for your employees. Um, do you think, is this unique to software where you actually do have the margins to do this? Or is this a model that you think can be exported to other or most industries? Well, I think most industries outside of the United States, well, not always, not just, we just stick to the U S yeah. I mean, um, I absolutely think this is, you can do this anywhere. I, I don't think this has anything to do with software. In fact, because most software companies don't do this. So it's, it's not inherent to software. Um, this to me, is or, or maybe, or maybe, or maybe inherent to an organization that has thick margins versus one that has thin. Yeah. Um, I think for, like for example, benefits and sharing that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And, and we couldn't afford to do this sort of thing. Our, our entire existence, we've layered these things over time. So mm -hmm. I think margins um, definitely give you the opportunity to spend more money on people, that sort of thing for sure. Um, but you know, margins aren't always a choice, but they're actually commonly more of a choice than people think. For example, you know, we only have 56 people at Basecamp intentionally. We could afford to have hundreds of people working here, but we choose not to. Um, that increases our margins. That allows us to spread more money mm -hmm. across 50 people versus across 200 people, which means we can do more things for those people. Um, of course, if you're working on razor thin margins, if you're a grocery store, if you're, you know, uh, something like that, it, you know, and your, and your profit margins three or four or 5% per item, like it's hard to do any of these things, but that doesn't mean you need to treat people poorly like that. Right. You can be, you should be humane no matter what. Um, but you may not be able to lavish certain things on people. I recognize that for sure. Um, but then again, I just want to re reiterate that in, in an industry where there are high margins, um, this is a choice. And most companies don't choose to do it. Most companies choose to throw all their money back into growth and push people harder and harder and harder and not treat them well. So I think it's an opportunity to treat people well. Margins are actually a great opportunity to treat people well. And you can achieve those margins in certain industries if you're careful about your costs. And this is something that isn't discussed enough in our industry, which is, which is the cost side of things. You know, well, well part, part of this. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, part of this is the just the Milton Friedman uh, reality of a publicly traded company versus private companies, yes. right? That sh we have a tradition in the U.S. where shareholders can p apply infinite pressure into complete maximization of the return on capital. Um, and in a private company, you have the flexibility to, as as you might, uh, there's probably just a couple of y'all that are the majority shareholders. Yep. Um, so you have the complete flexibility to let your values drive the company um, that a public company does not does not have. For sure, and um, I, I think probably my worst nightmare would be would my worst nightmare would be being a public company. Um, I, I have no interest in doing that. Um, it sounds like a horrible thing, and we're very intentional about um, not taking outside money. You know, we're, we're a bootstrap company. 100% of our funds are, are generated through customer sales. Um, so uh, that gives us a lot of flexibility and freedom to do the things that we do because we don't have to answer to you know the growth machine. We don't have to answer to public markets. We don't have to answer to quarterly numbers. Um, 
And I think that uh, more and more companies are beginning to realize that, that um, the pressures of the public and growth and eternal growth and quarterly growth, just it's not worth it. Um, it's just not doesn't make anybody really happy. And it forces companies into into tough positions. They have to do things they don't want to do, but they kind of have to do them because they have no choice. And I don't want to be there. I want for, for us and for me, independence is the most important thing. It allows us to do the right thing. It's frequently. So what what right. is what is what is the purpose of having a company? The purpose of it. Um, well, I, I don't like in general or my purpose. Your purpose. Yeah, like um, why like why have a company versus not have a company? Well, I have to work. So, um, you know, I have to put food on the table. I have to have a job like everybody else. And um, I wanted to create a company that I wanted to work at. Um, and so, you know, for me, uh, having a company means having a great job, uh, working on things that I care about, solving problems I care about, getting, to, getting a chance to work with brilliant people, um, getting a chance to work in a great environment where I can do the best work I can do. Um, so it's, it's a vehicle to, to do the, all those things. Um, hopefully we can have an impact. I think we have, but we don't, we didn't start this business to have an impact. We started this business to do the work that we wanted to do. And it just so happens that we're able to make a lot of money doing it as well. And we're able to take really good care of people as well and keep people around and, and, and see people grow and all those things. So that's what it is for me. It's not about like hitting numbers. So, you know, we don't have financial goals here at Basecamp. We don't actually have KPIs or any of that stuff. We just do that. And it was remarkable. <laughs> It's remarkable when I read that. Yeah, uh, we just book, do the best work we that, can because, like, why, why should a, why should a goal, an, auto, an an artificial goal, make you work harder or better? Like, you should do the best work you can because you take pride in the work. Like, that's to me the reason why you do the work. And so, I don't need to be pulled along by things I made up to chase. Um, I'd much rather just be to to, to like try to perfect my, my craft and, and get better at my craft, not even perfect, but just get better at my craft. And that's what everyone here is trying to do is just to get better at their work on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. So, so that's, that's how most revenue projections, uh, which are the hardest, usually the hardest things to meet for a performance evaluation for a division um, are, are, are done, right? That we grew revenue by 10% last year, let's say. So next year is going to be 12%. Um, those numbers are usually they're justified through whatever data, but it's it's really just made up in an Excel sheet. Yes. Um, so what first of all, what what is the consequence if you do not have a, a revenue projections or revenue goals? What, when you when you meet with um, your employees, how do you describe what they're trying to do without a revenue goal? Revenue. They don't do their work for revenue. Um, they they do their work. Based on whatever their their role is. So if you're a programmer, you're supposed to write great code, clear code that other people want to work in. If you're a designer, you've got to make great interfaces and, and be thoughtful about how you write and and communicate and let people you know use a product that you're making in, in a clear way that doesn't confuse them. If you're a customer service, you're supposed to help people. That's what you do. Um, the revenue side, the business side, that's essentially my responsibility. Um, and so, how do you think of it? If it, uh, how, how do you think of it on your on your? Yeah, end? I think of it in terms of like. Here's our costs. So, like, here's what it costs to keep the business running. You know, this is our our rent, our overhead, all that stuff, right? And we need to cover that. And, and we want also want to make more money than just simply cover it and break even. So, we think I think about in terms of you know pricing model and promotion and marketing and those kinds of things to get enough customers in the door that pay us, so everybody can do their job well and not have to worry about if their job contributes to, to generating revenue. That's just not like the job description of a designer or a programmer or customer service. We just don't think of things that way. So people aren't looking at numbers to hit. Um, they're just looking at trying to do a really, really good job. And that my job is to figure out how to build a business model that supports all of that. So that's kind of how we think about it. And, and so, so maybe some of this is about having a company that's got 50 employees, right? Where if you have a thousand employees, not there, there can't just be one person that's thinking about revenue, right? The CEO of a company of a thousand employees, even if it's private, um, has a million other things, and the revenue question is probably going to be on the CFO's plate. Um, so, how much of this is a function of size, where you're able to basically take all that ownership yourself um, because you're a smaller company? I mean, being a smaller company helps in some regards, but there's a lot of small companies that are obsessed with, with numbers and stats too. So again, like none of this is inherent sure. with size. I think it's just about your approach and can a company of a thousand people approach work this way? Maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe not, but I also don't care. Like I'm not, 
we're, we're optimized for ourselves um, as every mm -hmm. other company should be optimized for themselves. And this is sort of the model that we've figured out works well for us. I, we don't hire people here who are motivated to hit targets. That's not why people come to work here. They come to work here because the work environment allows them to do the best work of their careers. And my job is to run the business. That's not their job. My job is to run the business. Now, at a larger company, the business of running a business might be on 20 people's shoulders or 50 people's shoulders or whatever. Yeah. But like, it's still not, I mean, it shouldn't be, I, I don't believe everybody should be thinking about how the business is running when they're designing something or writing something or providing a service to a customer, you should be thinking about the work you're doing. And then the rest of there's other people in the organization that have a job that's about the business. And so that's kind of how we are. We just have a small organization. So there's fewer of us that have to think about the business. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to hold targets over people's heads and say like, you have to hit this. Why? Well, because I said so. Why? Well, because I made yeah. this up. Why? Because I yeah. don't know. Like, I just don't want to be that way. That's not the kind of business that we like to run here. Yeah. Well, and it's com it's completely made yes. up out of thin yes. air, um, arbitrary, and then set with can be people's entire livelihood can rest on that arbitrary number. Yeah. Now there is, there are real numbers, which is like here's our costs, and we got to cover those. Like that's probably the only yes. real number. Um, and after that, you get to decide, you know, how much margin you want and wh where you want to go with it. But um, but you know, costs are within. I've, I'm always surprised by this, and especially in our industry, and I talked, touched on this a little bit earlier here, which is that costs are not things that people talk enough about in our industry. So um, they'll talk about you know, hiring more people and growing and all these things, but those things you know, come with, with a cost themselves, which is that you have, to, you have to cover a lot more of those costs. And you, know, you can be a little bit more thoughtful about the, the nut you have to cover, essentially, and you can achieve profitability sooner. You can have more flexibility and more freedom. To me, profitability equals freedom, and uh, it equals time. You say like you can't buy time. Well, you kind of can buy time if you're profitable. You're buying time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So, if you don't have right, if you're if you have um, a, a VC backing you, you have a certain run. You might have a year. You might have eighteen months um, before you have to you, you you know before you have to be profitable. Yeah. Um, and, and then you're, you're running towards this thing and everyone's stressed out. This gets back to like running a calm company. You can't be yeah. calm if you're in the red. Like you just can't be because you know you might be out of business at any time. Mm -hmm. I thought it's interesting that you've uh, done away with negotiating salaries, um, done away with bonuses. Um, what, what are some of the ideas on, uh, on those management tools? Sure. So uh, it's ultimately seemed unfair to us that people need to be really, really good at two things. One, their job, that seems fair. But two, they need to be an ace negotiator to get what they're worth. People don't like negotiating. Like People don't like to negotiate for cars or for homes. I mean, some, I, some people do. Most people do not. They find it to be really burdensome and, and they're intimidated by it. And think about what it's like to go negotiate your salary with your manager. Your manager who might have 12 direct reports has a whole bunch of practice negotiating salaries. Like that's what your manager does 12 right. times a year, maybe even more. You, maybe once every two years, you have to go get up the metal to go talk to your manager and ask for more money. Like that's just a horrible asymmetric situation. It's just unfair. Um, and so the other thing that's unfair about it is that two people doing the exact same job with the same skills and experience can be paid different amounts of money. That seems unfair to me as well. So and a, lot, a lot of that's the gender defects totally. too. Um, the, the studies have shown that one of the reasons our women make more on average than men is that they negotiate less. Yeah. I mean, you, it's just like the whole thing is set up to be unfair. And, you know, I think you should be paid what you're worth. Um, not paid what you're able to get. And so what we do is we track industry averages in different roles and positions and levels. And we pay people at the 90th percentile based on San Francisco rates, which is the highest market in the industry for our in industry. Um, yes. And we don't even have anyone who lives in San Francisco. So it doesn't matter where you live, you get paid the exact same amount as anyone else who lives in San Francisco based on your skills and experience. So if you're a designer here or a lead designer or a principal designer, Every principal designer gets paid the same. Every lead designer gets paid the same. Every designer gets paid the same, which is 90%, 90%, 90th percentile San Francisco rates. Uh, and you can go live in a farm in Tennessee or you can go live in a high rise in New York. Doesn't matter. That's up to you. That's your life choice. You're going to get paid the exact same. Um, hmm. And so 
what that does is it eliminates negotiation, it eliminates bias, it eliminates all sorts of different things and just pays people the be- basically the best salary they can find. Certainly 90th percentile means there's someone who's slightly higher, um, but we're basically at the top of the market. And we just found that to be a calmer way to, to treat people, to take care of salaries and to make sure that people don't have to think about leaving this company because they're not being paid enough. They're being paid at the top of the market. So that feels really good to everybody and to us as well. And then, and then what's, what's the idea behind no bonuses? Ah, we've actually rolled bonuses into salaries. So what we used to do okay. is we used to have salaries or we used to have salaries and we used to have bonuses and the bonuses were arbitrary because again, we don't track things. So we're like, yeah, this year you get 10 grand more and this year you get seven grand more. And then it, even though it's quote free money, it's like, well, seven grand, I got 10 last year. Like it becomes expected. Yeah, it's like, it, yeah, it's just ex- yeah. bonuses are salary. Basically, exactly. So like, yeah, if you're getting less the next year for no good reason, it feels bad, even though it's money that you wouldn't have had, you know, it's, there's a psychological component here. So we said like, so our, our 90th percentile of San Francisco rates also include salary and equity grants that other companies make. So we're actually basing our salaries, not just on what they pay their employees in salaries, but also what they pay in bonuses. So this is all reported back to this company called Radford, which is a, a salary measuring company. And we, we measure our, our numbers against about 200 other companies, peer group. In, in our industry. And so we're taking salary, we're taking bonuses and equity grants into account essentially when we pay our salaries. So we just kind of rolled it and said, this is a real number that you can expect every year. And let's eliminate this BS about mm-hmm. bonuses. Cause it's just, if once it becomes expected, it is salary. All right. Well, I'm, I'm conscious of your time. Um, so I do want to thank you sure. so much. Um, I, I sincerely wish that other private companies, especially would take on, or at a minimum, this, every private company CEO should read your well, book. You. Um, I mean, uh, public companies, you know, would benefit as well, but they, they don't have the flexibility that, that you have in a private company to have a calm, sane organization. There's another thing I'd like to recommend if, if you have a second. Um, yeah. So yeah. do you know Om Malik? He's a, he's a journalist no. uh, and is also now a venture capitalist. But um, he, he interviewed a fellow named Brunello Cuccinelli. Uh, Brunello Cuccinelli mm-hmm. owns Brunello Cuccinelli, which is an Italian um, uh, clothing design firm. And... He, mm-hmm. he likes to run what he calls a humanistic company. Brunello Cuccinelli does. Um, and that includes paying people well. It includes a, a normal work day. It includes uh, no email or communications on the weekends or after work. It includes dignity of work, which means the environment has to be safe and clean and fair. Uh, it means that his products are priced high because that's what it costs. Um, it co- like to have the best materials and treat people well and take good care of people and create a safe s- environment means... Things cost more. Anyway, Ohm interviewed Brunello Cuccinelli, um, and I will send you a link. You can probably find it on Google. Go like Ohm, yeah. which is just O M mm-hmm. Brunello Cuccinelli. I'd highly recommend mm-hmm. reading that interview because it's a totally different industry. Okay. It's the clothing industry. It's a luxury clothing industry, but lo- clothing industry in Italy, talking about a lot of the same ideas that we're talking about in software, and, and it's it's wonderful. It's one of the most insightful interviews I've ever read and a huge inspiration for me. Um, Brunel Cuccinelli is a huge inspiration for me. And it's just another example of a way to run a humanistic business in a different industry. And I, well, I think, I think, thing. I think it's something that, I think it's something that Europe probably has over for us. Sure. Um, you know, they, they are already with, you know, the norms of 35 hour work week. Um, this idea of siestas of actual vacations. I mean, they already have it embedded in their culture in a way that, we just don't. And there's worse than us, which is Japan, yes. right? And I mean, Korea. Um, and China. I, if, you know, Japan yeah. and Korea. I, it's shocking. I was, in, uh, I was in Tokyo and I was walking the streets at like 2 a.m. And the offices, were, the lights were all on. And you could see people at work. And it was, it was 2 a.m. And I was, I was shocked. Yes. It's, it is a problem. Like the U.S. And, and a lot of Asian countries have this problem, which is extreme overwork, 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 overwork. And they treat people like resources and not like human beings. And it's challenging. I mean, at the same time, like some, some of those economies now they're developed, but like Korea was not a developed economy and China wasn't a developed economy for a while. And, and they've through, through sheer force and sheer will and throwing tons of people at the problem, like they've, they've lifted themselves up. And so I think it comes down to different times as well. I, I think once you're a developed economy, pushing people like an undeveloped economy is, is, is inhumane in a way that perhaps when you're trying to lift up an entire nation, 
may not be, you know, so it kind of depends. But like, I, I like to look at Germany as an example, huge economy, biggest in Europe, um, very reasonable work hours, 40 hour weeks, they take great care of people, yeah. they live, they enjoy their life, they're not working all the time. A lot of European countries do this. And yeah, they're not the United States. But so what? They're better in a lot of ways. I mean, I think that's, that's why that's why that's why I get back to my question that I asked you that you you pause to really think about because it's a hard one, which is what is the purpose of a company? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there is Right, the, from the Milton Friedman perspective, the purpose is simply to print as much money as humanly possible, um, as opposed to for anyone who's who's really sat and thought about this, it's to produce a good or a service or whatever you're doing in order for you know you to make enough money for employees to make enough money for there to be you know some kind of good for the public. Um, but once you've gotten to a certain point, endless growth is it's simply not good um, on any regard, um, and it, it's certainly not good for the employees. Um, and it's really, you know, it's really not good for the consumer. I mean, it, once your economy has reached a certain scale, um, you know, I, I think you have to start looking at things like gross national happiness and some of these broader measures um, that are just vital, vital for a civilization. Um, that I, I think we, it, it's just, it's so corrupted in the endless growth world. It is, and I, I think you're spot on there. And I think, I think it feels like things are maybe about to change um, for the better. That people are, are saying like, this is unsustainable. I'm not happy. Um, I'm, I'm stressed out. Um, I mean, you can even look at life expectancy in the US, which is beginning to decline. Now, there might be a number of reasons for that. Part of it is the opioid epidemic. A, 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 opiate. Stuff, for yeah. sure. But like, mm, there's a lot of stressed out people, a lot more anxious people these days than there used to be. And we're supposed to have all these wonderful luxuries, but it's not really panning out that way. So, you know... Um, I don't know. I think I think things are going to start to ch- start to change. It's going to take a while. Um, it might be a generational thing, but um, I think things are going to change for the better over time. And again, like you, you can look at Germany. They make amazing, amazing products. They've got you know Mercedes. They've got BMW. They've got Porsche. They've got Siemens. They've got sure. a number of the, the best products in the world come out of that country in their industry, in their different industries, and they have very reasonable work hours. It's possible. I mean, even NASA in the U.S. NASA works forty hour weeks. Like, and they send people to the moon. Well, they haven't for a while, but you know what I mean? Like they, they put satellites in space. They make yeah. amazing things. They, SpaceX is taking them well, out. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> but still, um, they've, they've achieved a lot, right? Um, so yeah. anyway, long story short is I think it's totally possible to do wonderful work in a reasonable amount of time. And most of the time, that's, the extra time that's spent in a lot of places is not spent on additional work. It's actually spent on, on minutia and inefficiencies. I think that there's a lot more to carve out of that before we begin to just throw more time at the problem. All right. Well, with that, um, thank you so much. This has been uh, an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for listening to the podcast today. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me at jeffshatton1 at gmail.com. You can tweet me at jeffshatton. If you like this podcast, press the subscribe button and make sure to rate it on iTunes so that other people can find it.